Howdy, everybody. Dr. Andy Woods here. I'm the pastor teacher here at Sugarland Bible Church. Today is August the 30th, 2024. This is Pastor's Point of View, number 317. And we're going to continue on in this particular session with uh, an outline that we really started last time. Um, in our last show together, we dealt with Gog Magog, World versus Israel and third temple rumblings in this particular show we're going to cover globalism the united states in decline uh, persecution and what the bible predicts concerning apostasy within the church and uh, i'm going to show you what i think is a very clear example of it so let's go ahead and start with our first, first bullet point here globalism as a biblical entry point, let's review Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23. It says, Thus he said, The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. You know, the language treading down, crushing, um, that is speaking of totalitarianism. And when it talks about the whole earth, it's speaking of globalism. So this is dealing with the final form of Gentile government that will exist on planet earth before Jesus returns in his second advent. The Bible is clear that global governance, global government will rule the day. The question becomes, how do you convince the nations of the earth to give up their existing sovereignty and freedom and acquiesce to global government. Well, Rahm Emanuel, former chief of staff under former President Barack Obama, gave us the formula. It's called management by crisis. He is uh, quoted as saying, quote, you never let a, a crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things you could not do before, close quote. In other words, government thrives on a crisis. Once a crisis hits, then government holds itself out as the savior to, to, for that crisis and increases its own power. So crisis management, management by crisis, is one of the great ways to move into globalism, totalitarianism. And once people are in a state of crisis, they're in a state of fear. And when they're in a state of fear, they naturally give up freedom and sovereignty to anyone or anything that promises to solve the crisis for them. The government says, just give us some police powers, emergency police powers, not telling you that they have no intention of relinquishing those police powers once they're acquired. Notice what quintessential globalist George Soros recently said, he said, quote, what is inconceivable in normal times becomes not only possible, but actually happens. People are disoriented and scared. Now, we've seen very clearly the crisis mentality that enveloped our world in 2020, leading to unprecedented uh, infringements on personal liberty. Uh, we're of the perspective that another crisis is looming on the horizon. Whether it's real or manufactured, the globalists telegraph their agenda. I mean, if it's, if it's a legitimate crisis, they'll exploit it. Or perhaps they'll push us into some kind of crisis that uh, uh, they themselves made up. Um, if the crisis is real, we'll exploit it, or perhaps we need to manufacture our own crisis. But notice what Justin Trudeau recently said. This is recorded in um, an article from the postmillennial.com, August the 17th, 2024. Keep in mind, Trudeau has led Canada into really unprecedented clampdowns on personal freedom. Notice what Trudeau recently said in this very recent article talking about a future looming crisis. 
It says the Trudeau government is again warning Canadians to be prepared for a potential new virus that could cause food and fuel shortages. The Center for Occupational Health and Safety came out with a second edition of its flu infectious disease outbreaks business continuity plan handbook in June. It focuses on a hypothetical virus that the center suggests could lead to lockdowns, food scarcity, and a public health crisis that accompanied by uh, that accompanied COVID-19. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau severely restricted the lives of Canadians who refused to receive COVID the COVID-19 vaccine. People could not travel, go to restaurants, or in many cases, uh, in many cases without being vaccinated. The mandates were challenged by a massive trucker protest that forced change, even though it was brutally suppressed by Trudeau. The guide stated that based on trends from the pandemic flu, there may be a higher average number of illnesses and deaths in age groups different than what we typically see during the flu season. The handbook suggested that companies need to prepare employees for working from home. This hypothetical pandemic can be expected to come in two or three waves, about three to nine months separating each outbreak for about two years. The report further predicted problems in the supply chain, communications, and banking while expecting scarcity of water, gasoline, medicine, and food. While Canada quietly prepares for another pandemic, former National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases Director Anthony Fauci has again urged Americans to mask up because COVID-19 is apparently on the rise again. President Joe Biden also is preparing for hypothetical viruses, creating a permanent pandemic preparedness office. Health official, officials have been fretting about bird influenza for months, even though the virus is unlikely to affect humans. The World Health Organization is now calling monkeypox or mpox a public health emergency of international concern, even though the disease is largely transmitted by male sexual activity. Who director last name Gabrenus has determined that the upsurge of monkeypox in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and a number of countries in Africa constitutes a public health emergency of international concern, sometimes called a PHEIC, public health emergency of international concern under the International Health Regulations 2005, the agency posted on its website Wednesday. In other words, this crisis mentality that we saw in 2020 is not going away. A lot of people think that COVID-19 with all of the government masking, clampdowns, crowd control, surveillance that we saw, a lot of think that is in our rearview mirror, but when you simply listen to these globalists talk, whether it's Gabrenus, Biden, Fauci, or Trudeau, they're constantly, constantly contemplating, dare I even say, constantly, constantly salivating over the next crisis as another way to grow government. And the interesting thing about uh, world health is it can't be solved within international borders. So you need some sort of transnational governmental bureaucracy to solve this crisis for us. People would never reach out for the help of a transnational intergovernmental bureaucracy without a crisis. And when you listen to these globalists talk, they're constantly contemplating the next crisis. In fact, notice this particular article from Breitbart 
August the 14th, 2024, it says WHO, the World Health Organization, declares monkeypox a global health emergency. The article says the World Health Organization on Wednesday declared that monkeypox surge in Africa, um, they declared it a global public health emergency sounding its highest possible alarm over, over the worsening situation. Worried by the rise in cases of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the spread to nearby countries, the WHO hastily convened a meeting of experts to study the outbreak. Today, emergency, the emergency committee met and advised me, this is Gabrenus talking, the head of the World Health Organization, Today, the emergency com committee uh, met and advised me that in its view, the situation constitutes a public health emergency of international concern, global concern, in other words. I have accepted the advice who Chief Gabrenus told a press conference. A PHEIC, which we defined earlier as a public health emergency of international concern is the highest level of alarm under the international health regula regulations, which are binding on 196 countries. It is clear that a coordinated international response is essential to stop these outbreaks and save lives. Notice this language here, coordinated international response. Notice this language here, legally binding on 196 countries. Uh, I, I believe that the true crisis is not so much whatever virus comes our direction, but it's the international apparatus that will be put in place to supposedly protect us from the crisis. People we don't vote for, people we don't elect, people that will have the legal power to micromanage our lives. That's the real crisis. And that will be used, this management by crisis mindset, continually, I believe, until we're into full-blown global governance as a strategy of the globalists to push us in the direction of what Daniel chapter 7, verse 23 predicts, global government, global tyranny in the last days. A PHEIC has only been declared seven times since 2009. One over H191 swine flu, then another one over polio virus, then another one over Ebola, another one over the Zika virus, then Ebola again, then COVID-19, and now monkeypox. So when you see the global authorities issuing this P-H-E-I-C, which again stands for a public emergency of international concern, you have to keep in mind that it's only been used seven times. And now it's been um, implemented a seventh time to supposedly protect us from monkeypox, which is actually a disease that is spread through sexual immorality, uh, homosexuality, forms of sexuality that deviate from God's blueprint for sexuality. And this is the kind of world that we're living in. These are all pretexts, if you will, for the global governance that's coming. And one of the things that global government does not want you to have is they don't want you to have independence. That's why they have declared war on your gas-powered stove and your gas-powered car <laughs> vehicle. Notice uh, this particular article from the dailycaller.com, again, recent article, August the 13th, 2024, and it says the Biden administration cements gas stove rule after insisting it isn't going after gas stoves. 
we're not going after gas stoves, they keep saying, but then they keep pushing these executive orders which seem to regulate one's gas stove. The article says the Biden administration locked in a gas stove rule on Monday. The Department of Energy has gone ahead with its rule over the objections of several Republican state attorneys generals, general, excuse me, and advocacy groups, including the Competitive Enterprise uh, Institute, otherwise known as the CEI. Besides the CEI and sub-Republican attorneys general, the Antonin Scalia Law School Administrative Law Clinic and other groups also commented against the DOE's rule. Notably, Biden administration officials submitted an amicus brief asking a federal court to reverse a decision that nixed Berkeley, California's 2019 ban on gas hookups in new buildings, a policy that ostensibly could have outlawed the installation of gas stoves in newly constructed buildings. The article concludes when it says more than 80% of Republican respondents and 71% of independents were opposed to policies that would induce a gas stove ban, as were 55% of surveyed Democrats. So it's interesting how they keep saying, you know, we're not going after the gas stove. And then they keep po passing policies that go after the gas stove through an executive order. I think what you're seeing at play here is the Hegelian dialect. The change comes from the conflict between the thesis and the antithesis. Thesis, let's regulate gas stoves. Antithesis, let's not regulate gas stoves. Middle ground, let's come up with kind of a moderate regulation of gas stoves. And once they get that moderate regulation, they could push the ball forward to further regulations on gas stoves. The issue becomes, why are they perpetually going after the gas stove? Well, the answer is a gas stove allows you to be independent. If there's some kind of electrical power shutdown, you know, if the government decides you're non-compliant with the government narrative, they can th click a button and your ability to cook food on an electric stove disappears. Now think about this for a moment. They don't have that ability related to gas stoves because it's an independent source of energy. The New World Order doesn't want you free. It doesn't want you independent. It's the same reason why there's this perpetual push to get us into these electrical powered cars because the same issue is in play. If you step out of line, uh, if you're not compliant with the government narrative, if you're politically incorrect, then with the click of a switch, you're cut off from electrical power. If you're cut off from electrical power, then your ability to travel is limited. The government can't do that when you're in a gas-powered vehicle. So that's why you're seeing all of this push towards uh, electric stoves only in the name of protecting the environment and electrical cars only in the name of protecting the environment. It's a ruse, if you will, to take the population of the United States and really the population of the world and make it dependent upon the new world order, not independent of the new world order. So these are all signs that we're moving into more aggressively global governance. Management by crisis is constantly being used to get us to acquiesce to giving up more freedom, sovereignty, independence, and liberty. And the moment we move into these electrical vehicles and electric stoves and we're cut off from independent sources of power and energy, the more dependent we become and the easier it is for the new world order to keep control and to keep things under control.
One of the things that has to be destroyed before the New World Order can come into existence is a free and independent and prosperous United States of America. So this moves us into our next bullet point, the United States of America in decline. As America declines, it creates a vacuum for more and more international global control. You can't have a new world order with a free and independent America and a constitution and declaration of independence which grants our citizens so much freedom and so much opportunity as inalienable rights from God. That concept has to disappear to pave the way for maximum governance of the New World Order. So the, so all of the articles that you see about the decline of the United States of America are largely preparatory for global governance, which we know is on the horizon, albeit Daniel uh, chapter 7 and verse 24. So the United States of America, make no mistake about it, is in precipitous decline. And all you have to do is look at the campaign slogans of one of the individuals that at the time of this recording is running for president. In essence, what she is advocating is Marxism or communism, which has really never worked throughout the world. I mean, there's a reason why the world is trying to get into our country, as I'll explain in just a minute. It relates to the fact that the Marxist utopias that people have been promised in other parts of the world didn't work. And so as our country flirts with communism and Marxism, it will lead to the precipitous decline of the United States of America. Notice this article here from the Washington Post concerning Kamala Harris's Marxist policies that she is now advocating as she is seeking to be elected President of the United States this November. It's an opinion piece, and it says the Times demands serious economic ideas. Harris supplies gimmicks. Price gouging is not causing inflation, so why is the vice president promising to stamp it out? Question mark. In other words, what she's interested in is price controls or the government controls prices as a means of controlling inflation. She's not advocating reducing government spending. She's not advocating reducing our national indebtedness. She's not advocating as a solution to controlling inflation, um, independent energy, domestic oil exploration. What she wants to do is the government to get involved in setting the prices of things, which is, which is nothing more than Marxism, where the government tries to control the free market. Notice this from the New York Post. It's a cover shot. It's entitled Communism, named after Kamala Harris. And the headline reads, Harris unveils a budget-breaking $1.7 trillion economic plan that includes government price controls. What is that? It's nothing more than warmed-over Marxism, which will take the prosperity of the United States and destroy it, just like communism has destroyed prosperity wherever it's implemented. Take Venezuela as an example, where the middle class is now eating out of you know trash, uh, trash cans, just to survive. That is the fruit of the root of what we would call Marxism or communism. Now, why is all of this prophetically significant? It's prophetically significant because the United States has to be reduced. There's no better way to do that than communism. Make America a socialist or a communist or a Marxist state, which will take our prosperity and reduce it and lower us, making it easier for the new world order to fill that vacuum um, and seize power. So what is now in ascendancy is socialism or communism, 
what's the difference between a socialist and a communist? Uh, a communist is just a socialist who's in more of a hurry. I guess we could put it that way. Look at the ascendancy in the last election cycle of Bernie Sanders. All of these young people voting for Bernie Sanders, who's basically a, an avowed socialist, because he's promised to give them certain things, like getting rid of their student debts or whatever. And people don't recognize this as government control, Marxism or communism, as these ideas become more and more popular. They certainly were popular in the Bernie Sanders election cycle. They're certainly popular with Kamala Harris. We largely see these things as a fulfillment of God's prophetic word, which doesn't predict a free and independent and prosperous United States of America, but maximum uh, global governance. One of the things that is lowering the United States of America aggressively is our op open borders policy. Notice this slide here, it gives you the divine institutions. These are the institutions that the creator has built into the fabric of fallen creation, allowing fallen creation to be sustained. Uh, societies that acknowledge these divine institutions survive and thrive. Those that reject these divine institutions find themselves on the ash heap of history. Recognizing and following these divine institutions is what makes any country great. Proverbs 14, verse 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation. Nations that acknowledge God and respect what he has built into the fabric of fallen creation related to divine institutions generally prosper. There's the institution of conscience, marriage and the family. You can see the scripture verses in early Genesis where you can find all of these. The institution of divine labor, the institution of government, li limited government, and the institution of nationalism. Now, all of these are grossly under attack today, which is explaining why the United States is in decline. Let's focus just for a moment on the one I have underlined there, nationalism. God is the one at the Tower of Babel that created the nation state. God does not want our world governed by global government. He wants it governed by individual nations. With that being said, what makes up a nation? Notice this slide here. It's entitled the sine qua non of nationhood. Sine qua non is a Latin expression, which means without which... There is not. In other words, if you take away one of these concepts, you don't have a nation anymore. What makes a nation? Four things. Common currency, common language, common culture, and enforceable borders. Now, all of these are under attack today, which explains why the nation of the United States is in decline. One of the ones that's being aggressively demoted today is enforceable borders. Folks, if you don't have enforceable borders, you don't have a country any more than you can have a leader of a family or the leader of a home. When anyone is permitted to enter your home, front door or back door, regardless of whether you approve their entry or not, that's what we're being forced into with these um, unenforceable borders, which is which essentially is destroying us as an independent and na national sovereign entity. So the more we have this immigration crisis, border crisis in our world, the more the doctrine of the nation state is being attacked, the more one of the great divine institutions that God has created is under assault, which is all necessary to pave the way for global governance. You can't have a free and independent and prosperous United States and global government at the same time. So the United States has to be sort of whittled down to size. And one of the ways this is happening is through open borders. Notice uh, this particular article here. This comes from justthenews.com. August the 17th, 2024, it says illegal border crossings surpass 
12.5 million since Biden-Harris took office, the most in U.S. history. The article says the total number of apprehended illegal border crossers surpassed 10.5 million in July with two months left in the fiscal year, which ends September the 30th. That number excludes 2 million gotaways, those who illegally entered and, and evaded capture, bringing the total number up to more than 12.5 million. That is greater than the individual populations of 45 states. If illegal border crossers were a state, they'd be the sixth most populous state ahead of Illinois. No other presidential administration in U.S. history has ever reported even a fraction of the 12.5 million in one term, let alone multiple terms combined. As the Center Square has reported every month since early 2021, after President Joe Biden took office, the number of illegal border crossers increased. Despite the false narrative they're attempting to project, the unprecedented border crisis the president and his border czar have created continues to rage on. U.S. House Committee on Homeland Security Chairman Representative Mark Green, Republican of Tennessee, said. Green said the Biden-Harris border policies have done damage that will take decades to remedy. And for the families of Americans like Lake, Lake and Riley, Rachel Morin, Jocelyn Nungare, that damage will never be undone, referring to two women and a 12-year-old girl who were murdered by criminal foreign nationals released into the country by the Biden-Harris administration. The benchmark for records is the unprecedented number of app apprehended at the northern border, the highest by far under this administration than any other recorded in history. So the truth of the matter, folks, is we're not in the middle of a border problem. <laughs> we're in the middle of a border crisis. Our borders literally are wide open, which is not sustainable for any country. And I believe that this open borders mentality, as demonstrated by the Biden-Harris administration, is by design. It's designed to reduce the United States of America to almost nothing because their agenda is globalism, not nationalism. In other words, they're trying to reverse what God implemented at the Tower of Babel. Now, to prove this, I want to show you this quote here from Kamala Harris, who is seeking to become the next president of the United States. Uh, this is a comment that she made back in April of 2021, and it's an astounding comment. Because people are asking, how come they're not enforcing the border? How come she doesn't visit the border? How come she's the border czar and demonstrates very little knowledge of the border? There's a reason for that. She has taken the concept of border enforcement and outsourced it to the UN. Notice what she says. Quote, we're going to be increasing requests that we're making of our allies in the United Nations, Harris said. Harris continued insisting that the United States must institutionalize and internationalize the migration issues. This has to be a function of an American priority, but we are a neighbor in the Western Hemisphere, she said, noting that she has been working with the UN to help, uh, excuse me, to obtain help from the international community. I hope you see what she just did in that quote. She just took the concept of border enforcement and out outsourced it to the United Nations, outsourced it to global governance. In other words, it's not the responsibility of the United States to import, uh, enforce its own borders. That's the collective responsibility of the various nations of the earth under the United Nations. And a lot of people just scratch their head as to why our borders are wide open, 
why Kamala Harris doesn't do any meaningful visitation to the border, even though she's the border czar. Well, in her mind, the border is basically irrelevant. They outsourced that to the United Nations a long time ago. And so you see what's happening here. We don't have enforceable borders. We're not a nation without enforceable borders. And that's by design to fit us into the great framework of the global community, which is a pretext for global governance. And so all of these things that we're reading about are flirtation with communism, wage and price controls, open borders. That's all by design to reduce the United States, which has to be reduced to have global governance. I mean, the people of the earth are not gonna look to global government as the solution to their problems as long as a free and independent United States of America exists. And so everything that we're seeing here concerning the deliberate demolition of the United States of America is prophetically significant because it's pushing us into the new world order. Let's move to our next uh, major area here, second to last, and this has to do with persecution. I mean, no one wants to talk about persecution against God's people through the heavy hand of government, but that's something that will manifest itself in the last days. It's predicted in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and verse 6, John describing the one world system of the last days says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wandered greatly. Verse 15, and he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The harlot is the last day's system of the Antichrist covering, in terms of its influence, the whole earth. And then notice that this harlot or this woman is drunk with the blood of the saints. She is involved in aggressive persecution against the people of God. I believe that many of the things happening abroad, I'll talk about some things happening at home in just a minute, but some recent things happening abroad are pushing us into the type of persecution that the Bible predicts for the end of the age. Notice this article here by Fox News, August 9th, 2024. It deals with what's happening in the UK. It says the UK police commissioner threatens to extradite, jail US citizens over online posts. We'll come after you. Being a keyboard warrior does not make you safe from the law, the police commissioner warned. What is happening is you're seeing people criminalized, prosecuted, convicted, jailed, punished in the UK for what they post online. Notice what the article says. London's Metropolitan Police Chief warned that officials will not only be cracking down on British citizens for commentary on the riots in the UK, but on American citizens as well. In other words, if an American posts something that is considered hate speech in the UK, hate speech is very nebulously defined. I mean, that's like a... You can make hate speech into anything. Well, such individuals will be extradited, what he's saying here, legally taken from the United States, brought to the UK to be jailed, prisoned, and punished, totally based on what you happen to post online. I mean, this is the type of world drenched in totalitarianism that we are descending into. He says, we will throw the full force of the law at people. And whether you're in this country committing crimes on the streets or committing crimes from further afield online, we will come after you. Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Michael Rowley told Sky News. One key aspect that makes this apparent crackdown on social media particularly shocking to critics is that the British government is threatening to extradite American 
citizens from the U.S. to be jailed in the U.K. for violating their rules about political speech online. A Sky News reporter asked Commissioner Rowley to further explain his warning, arguing that high-profile figures have been whipping up hatred and that the likes of Elon Musk have been getting involved. She then asked what the police force's plan will be when it comes to dealing with people who are whipping up this kind of behavior from behind the keyboard who may be in a different country. Rowley answered by telling the reporter, being a keyboard warrior does not make you safe from the law. You can be guilty of offenses of incitement, of stirring up racial hatred. There are numerous terrorist offenses regarding the publishing of material. He said, all of these offenses are in play. If people are provoking hatred and violence on the streets, we will come after those individuals just as we will physically confront on the streets the thugs and those who are taking, who are causing problems for communities. Elon Musk made headlines for criticizing Prime Minister Starmer's response to the riots over the past week, suggesting the UK is headed towards a civil war. He also responded to a video of someone allegedly arrested for offensive online comments with the question, is this Britain or the Soviet Union? Starmer's spokesperson said there was no justification for, for Musk's comments adding that the social media companies can and should be doing more to combat misinformation, the BBC reported. He added that such companies can have a responsibility to stop the spread of criminal activity and limit misinformation. Notice this, misinformation, disinformation is now criminal. What you do online in a different country is now criminal according to this new definition and according to this uh, new standard, we're going to go after people for hate speech. Well, I think most of us are against hate, but I hope we understand how ambiguous hate speech is. If I were to say the nation of Israel is God's chosen people and no other nation is, is that hate speech? If I were to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, quoting John 14, verse 6, and no man comes to the Father but by him, excluding all other religions, is that hate speech? If I were to get online and say homosexuality is a sin, and somehow that leads to, unfortunately, violence committed against a homosexual in another country, could I be extradited? simply by quoting Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. I mean, you, I, I hope you can see the, the, the door that this opens into totalitarianism. It's interesting that the UK is moving in this direction because the Labour Party just had a big political victory. UK is moving left. This is how the left wants to spend its resources. I mean, think of all of the resources... <laughs> that they're expending here to go after true crime, drug dealers, shop breakers. And instead they're pouring all of that energy to what people in other countries post online. It's, it's amazing what's happening. This is breaking out globally. It's breaking out worldwide. Here is um, another post. Uh, this one also from Fox News, written by Alexander Hall. It says, UK police commissioner threatens to extradite jail U.S. citizens over online posts. We'll come after you. Being a keyboard warrior does not make you safe from the law, the police commissioner warned. Boy, I, I thought it was free speech to express my ideas online. I mean, if Elon Musk wants to compare the UK to the Soviet Union, shouldn't he be free to do that without facing criminal charges from, from some kind of distant country? But this uh, individual apparently is saying the exact opposite. Um, here is uh, yet another article, this one from End Wokeness. It says, Met Police Commissioner Mark Rowley threatens to extradite 
and imprison American citizens over online posts. He does not rule out Elon Musk. Notice this uh, particular post from Telegraph Reporters. It says this, You will be refused bail even if you only watched riots from the sidelines, a judge warns. So there's a riot that breaks out. You didn't cause it. You're not urging people to participate in it. You didn't post anything online urging people to participate. You were just observing it. Well, you can be criminally charged for that in the UK. The article says whether active participants participant or curious observer, Any, anybody involved in disorder will be locked up, Belfast Court is told, August the 9th, 2024. A judge has warned that anybody present at a riot will be remanded in custody, even if they were only a curious observer. Here's an article Indicating, this is from the RT.com, August 18th, 2024, UK to treat extreme misogyny, hatred of women, as terrorism. Notice what the article says. Extreme misogyny in the UK will be treated the same as Islamists and far-right extremism under a new government plan aimed at addressing gaps in the country's counterterrorism strategy, the Sunday Telegraph has reported. The updated guidance is expected to legally oblige teachers to refer pupils they suspect of extreme misogyny to the government's counterterrorism program known as PREVENT. We're going to try to prevent crimes before they happen by identifying early on misogynists. Now, we're all against misogyny, hatred of women, but what constitutes misogyny? If I'm a little too aggressive in the public school classroom, quoting 1 Timothy 2, 12 and 13, that in the ecclesiastical world, in the church world, a woman is not to teach nor exercise authority over a man, does that mean I'll get reported? Am I a misogynist? Am I an extreme right winger? Am I on par with a terrorist Islamist under these new rules? Thank you, Labor Party UK. Currently, teachers, healthcare professionals, and local authorities and staff are required to make a referral to the program if they believe someone is susceptible to becoming radicalized. For too long, governments have failed to address the rise of extremism both online and on our streets, and we've seen the number of young people radicalized online growing. Cooper told the, the paper pledging to close any gaps in existing policy that prevent authorities from crackdown on violence. The comprehensive review of the PREVENT program, which is expected to be completed as soon as autumn, will focus on developing and updating strategic approach that involves close collaboration between government and communities. Notice that. The list also includes online subculture called INCEL, short for involuntary celibate. This refers to a misogynistic worldview promoted by men who blame women for men's lack of romantic prospects. So a guy's having trouble getting dates. Too many women are turning him down. So he's part of this um, incel group. And uh, he's negative towards women. Well, now he's, a, he's an extremist. He's a domestic terrorist. He needs to be put on a watch list. We need collaboration between government and private groups to monitor these people. I mean, I hope, I hope you see what this is the deterioration of, of any reasonable freedom in the UK. A February study conducted by UK Telecommunications Multinational Vatafone found that 70% of teachers have seen a rise in sexist language in their classrooms. 
over the past year, while 69% of boys had encountered posts promoting misogyny, it was also revealed that 42% of parents had heard their sons make inappropriate comments because of what they have seen online. Notice the focus is online. They're very worried about free speech. They're worried about misogyny, hatred of women. Well, so am I but I don't want to get into the business of classifying would-be misogynists and criminalizing them for simply holding an attitude, expressing a thought, posting a sentiment online. And this is what's happening abroad. The concept of freedom of speech, freedom of association is rapidly deteriorating worldwide. It's tragic to think about all of this but at the same time, it's what God said would happen. It's a sign of the times. Here's an article. Uh, this one put out by Sky News, August the 4th, 2024. It says, sound familiar, Australia? Prosecution of a novelist who dared criticize Germany's authoritarian government sets a very dangerous precedent. This article says the German constitution known as basic law enshrines the fundamental right of freedom of expression. This right forms the cornerstone of a democratic society, ensuring that all voices, no matter how controversial or dissenting, are heard and respected. However, in recent years, this constitutional guarantee has faced significant challenges. In short, the guarantee is no longer guaranteed. Terms like misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech have become increasingly weaponized by various entities, both governmental and private. One clearly defined once uh, in clearly defined and intended to protect the public from harmful and false narratives, these terms are now employed as tools of control. The weaponization of language serves to silence dissent, intimidate critics, and stifle open debate. The very freedoms intended to empower individuals and safeguard democracy are being curtailed by the subjective application of the terms. The case of C.J. Hopkins, an award-winning playwright, novelist, and political uh, satirist, 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 I think is how you say that, satirist, there we go, illustrates this very point. An American living in Berlin since 2004, Hopkins gained international acclaim for his sharp critiques of modern politics and government overreach. His work, including the bestseller, The Rise of the New Normal Reich, Consent Factory Essays, has stirred both admiration and consternation. His outspoken views have also made him a target of German authorities. Hopkins began with a series of tweets which got him into trouble two years ago, which criticized COVID-19 mask mandates, calling them ideological conformity symbols. His comparison over modern day Germ Germany to Nazi Germany unleashed a storm. What followed was a criminal investigation, book bans and contentious legal battles all aimed at silencing dissent. Australians should pay attention. Hopkins is a clear case of the global crackdown of dissent. Notice that word, global. Obviously, this isn't Germany, just about Germany or Hopkins. It's about who controls the narrative, who decides what's fact or fiction, what's appropriate or not. The erosion of free speech is a global issue. As Hopkins eloquently put it, it's one big global capitalist world now. See his emphasis here explaining this crackdown on him is global. Doesn't does that sound like global government persecuting a certain class of people 
That's what's breaking out in Germany. It's what's breaking out in the UK. It's breaking out in Australia. It's breaking out at home here, as I'll show you in just a moment. He explains, one of the reasons I settled in Berlin 20 years ago was that given its history and the general atmosphere of the people I met here, it felt like the last place on earth that would ever flirt with any kind of totalitarianism again. I was really happy here until the spring of 2020. Well, what happened in the spring of 2020? The COVID situation happened. And he began comparing the COVID lockdowns to Nazi Germany. And the German authorities said, you've gone too far. You've crossed a line. And even though he's an award-winning author and intellect and, and societal critic, he became the enemy of the state just that fast. He says, quote, Then I watched the city go full-blown totalitarian again in the course of six to eight weeks. People just clicked their heels and followed orders. Countries like Germany, which for many decades guardians of free speech, now seem to punish those who dare to speak out. As a clearly disillusioned Hopkins warned, this is happening throughout the West, not just Germany. The criminalization of dissent is a global story. Hopkins continued, since 2016, I've been documenting what I view as the transition to a more authoritarian or totalitarian version of global capitalism, which is the system we all live under here in the EU, the USA, Australia, China, and everywhere. This article says, Australia, take note. This isn't just Germany's problem. It's a global, and I'm emphasizing that word global as it appears a number of times in this article for good reason. It's a global struggle for freedom to speak, think, and dissent. If we don't stand up now, who will dictate our next reality? That's what this article says. This is a global crackdown on what used to be called freedom of expression, freedom of thought, uh, freedom of speech. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm an American and that's just out there somewhere. It's not happening here. It is happening here. Our very Constitution is constantly being set aside. Notice this particular article from World Net Daily, Bob Unruh, August the 16th, 2024. It says, a man wrongly convicted of murder cannot rid himself of prosecutor Kamala Harris's cackle in his face. Now I'm bringing up Kamala Harris and her ignoring of the legal rules of evidence and the Constitution because I want people to see, if she's elected, the type of totalitarianism our country will rapidly disintegrate into. If someone does the kinds of things that Kamala Harris did when she was attorney general in the state of California, as I'll show you in a minute, what in the world is she going to do with the virtual unlimited powers of the national government, like the Patriot Act, for example? I mean, if she abused her position as attorney general in California, what is she going to do with the whole country? What is she going to do with the, as the leader of the so-called free world. Here's what the article says. It's the Daily Mail that reported that on the taunt from Harris in a case involving a California man, Jamal True Love. He was wrongfully convicted of murder by Harris and now he's and now has charged that she laughed in his face when the verdict was read in court. He was sentenced to 50 years, but it turned out he was framed by police for the shooting death of his friend in 2007. Harris was the prosecutor in San Francisco at the time. The conviction was overturned, but only after True Love spent six years in prison for something he didn't do. In an interview with the Art of Dialogue talk show, he said he's been unable to shake T Harris's cruel taunt. 
We locked eyes this one time and she laughed, he said. She literally just like kind of burst out laughing almost as if she was pointing, ha ha. See, a lot of people look at this Kamala laugh as signs that she's a little odd. But he's saying it was ridicule aimed at him like I got you and I threw away your rights to get you convicted of a crime you never committed. True Love was exonerated in 2015, retrial charged in his civil case that four officers fabricated evidence, forced a key witness, and withheld critical information. The civil jury determined two homicide detectives violated his civil rights. Worse than pursuing a wrongful conviction, Harris has been accused of trying to keep those convictions when they are documented as wrong. It is Laura Bazelon, formerly director of Loyola Law School's Project for the Innocent, who explained, quote, most troubling, Miss Harris fought tooth and nail to uphold wrongful convictions that had been secured through official misconduct that included evidence tampering, false testimony, and the suppression of crucial information by prosecutors. I mean, this is what Kamala Harris did as the attorney general, the leading law enforcement official in the state of California, related to a man who was wrongfully accused, spent five years in jail, later exonerated, critiqued by a loyal, excuse me, Loyola Law School professor, because she fought tooth and nail to uphold wrongful convictions that had been secured through official misconduct that included evidence tampering? You're going to trust someone like that with the powers of the national government? I mean, if if she's elected, the type of persecution that we're seeing now is about to move into full orbit. I don't want to see it come. But at the same time, I understand that it's prophetically significant because God said global government will persecute God's people in the end times. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 6. Well, cheer up, folks. It gets worse. Here's an article from Just the News. Double standard. Tulsi Gabbard, you remember who brought some of these issues out about Kamala Harris in a presidential Democratic primary. Tulsi Gabbard has been put on a watch list while a terror suspect is let go to plan assassinations. August the 9th, 2024. It says, while the Biden administration placed former rep Tulsi Gabbard on a watch list, the FBI released into the U.S., on special parole, a Pakistani man who sought to plan the assassination of Donald Trump and other politicians. According to several whistleblowers, Gabbard, a military officer and a former Hawaii congresswoman and presidential candidate, a conservative now in other words, was placed on a watch list Under Quiet Skies, a TSA surveillance program designed to focus on law enforcement resources on travelers that represent an elevated risk to aviation security. Gabbard confirmed the heightened security attention on her in an interview with Matt uh, Taibbi, I think is how you say that. She described when she boarded a flight, TSA agents conducted a thorough screening patting down every inch, searching all corners of her luggage, and individually inspected her electronic devices. I've got a couple of blazers in there, and they're squeezing every inch of the entire collar, every inch of the sleeves, every inch of the edging of the blazers, she told the interviewer. They're squeezing or patting down underwear, bras, workout clothes, every piece of clothing 
Yet, while the government surveilled Gabbard, the FBI allowed an individual whose last name is Merchant to enter the U.S. in April with special permission known as significant public benefit parole, even though he was flagged on terrorism on a terrorism watch list and recently traveled to Iran, according to government documents reviewed and reported on by just the news. Merchant would later go on to organize an assassination plot targeting U.S. politicians, though he ended up trying to recruit undercover law enforcement as the hitman leading to his arrest shortly before his attempt to leave the country. So this individual merchant, free pass. Tulsi Gabbard, clamp down. She's on a watch list. Uh, harassment. Why the difference? Tulsi Gabbard's on the wrong side of the narrative that the government wants to promote. Apparently this uh, assassin is on the right side of the narrative. And this is what bothers me about all of these things. There's a common thread running through these articles. Is that people that are law-abiding citizens are being turned into co common criminals under this new narrative, this new way of thinking. It's happening internationally. It's happening globally. And it's happening domestically as well. What about... Uh, Vice presidential nominee Tim Walls when he was the governor of Minnesota. What is his record on these things? Notice this article from the New York Post, August the 13th, 2024. It says a shocking video shows cops enforcing Tim Walls' curfew by shooting paintballs at residents as they stood in their doorways. And there's a video embedded in this article that I would encourage you to watch. It says, during video, a uh, disturbing video shows dozens of riot cops enforcing Governor Tim Wall's curfew order spreading out in a Minnesota neighborhood and peppering residents with paintballs as they stood on their porches and their front doorways. The newly resurfaced clip filmed back in 2020 by an individual just outside of her home resembles a scene from a dystopian movie. It shows a tan Humvee rolling down a quiet street in the Whittier neighborhood, followed by at least 25 heavily armed cops. People can be heard saying, look at this, they just keep coming, before she's cut off by several officers barking orders at full volume. Go home, get inside your house now, let's go, the officers shouted as they traipsed down the street. The woman kept filming at which at one point an officer could be heard saying, light him up. Suddenly the officers fired paintballs at the woman and her guests. The gun's muzzle flash clearly visible against the fading light of dusk. Get in, get in, get in, get in, the resident shouted to her friends as they made their mad dash to get out of the line of fire. The muffled chorus of shouting police voices continued through the hastily slammed door. The incident came just days after the Minnesota governor, now Vice President Kamala Harris's running mate, issued a draconian executive order imposing an 8 p.m. curfew for all Minneapolis and St. Paul in order to tamp down the violent riots following the murder of uh, George, George Floyd. What, what's happening here is Tim Walls, who's, as you know, now a vice presidential candidate with running might of Harris for the vice presidency of the United States, there as governor of Minnesota, basically let Minneapolis burn with all of the BLM rioting. No enforcement whatsoever. But then he issues this curfew 
and related to law-abiding citizens in a middle-class residential neighborhood who do not abide by his curfew and are not in their houses by 8 p.m., he instructs his police officers to shoot paintballs at them. Now, I've actually engaged in the game Paintball Wars. And, you know, you think of a paintball as just kind of like a water balloon, something that really doesn't hurt. You know, before we did Paintball Wars, we had tons of instruction about don't take your goggles off, keep your helmet on, because your eye could get knocked out by this uh, projectile. When the paintball hits you, it, hit, it hurts a great deal. And in this video, you can see the people in pain as they're trying to make their way into the house and, you know, shut the um, front door. So this is what Tim Walls does to his own citizens while the real criminals, BLM, riot, burn, destroy, commit mayhem, mayhem in Minneapolis. He doesn't enforce any of the laws against them, but he turns his attention against normally <laughs> law-abiding citizens. Uh, it, it's, it's just astounding that these things have happened, and they're going to get worse should Harrison Walls assume power in the United States of America. One other fast uh, article on Tim Walls. This one comes from the dailywire.com, August the 13th. Minnesota grandma. This is a grandma. See how the law-abiding are being turned into criminals under this new totalitarianism? A Minnesota grandma says Walls is a bully and evil after she was locked up for violating his COVID policies. Minnesota grandma Lisa Hansen labeled her governor Tim Walls a bully and evil after she was locked up for violating his COVID policies and said the legacy media is lying to you about vice presidential Kamala Harris's running mate. In an interview with Fox News, the former wine and coffee bistro owner said that Walls is cuddly couldn't be further from the truth. Warning Americans about the kind of tyranny Walls has put on Minnesotans. Hansen was sentenced to 90 days behind bars and served 60 for violating Walls' lockdown order. She explained that she missed her wedding anniversary, Christmas, the birth of her grandchildren, because of the governor. Not to mention that she said Walls shut down and destroyed her family business, the outlet noted. He shut down a lot of mom and pop shops. Those folks that were just trying to make a living and provide a great product and a great service, Hansen said. In contrast, he allowed big box stores, etc. to stay open. Really incredible, an incredible use of tyranny, the T word, against people. The grandmother said that eventually she decided to reopen when Walls was refusing to let her business do so. I can never have that time back. That time was stolen from me, Hansen said. My business was destroyed. My business is gone. After everything that happened, Tim Walls and Keith Ellison a Minnesota attorney general, destroyed my business. They wrecked my life, Hansen said. After incurring tens of thousands of dollars in legal f fees and fines, she eventually closed her business after all the pressure from Wall's government. This is a story that America needs to hear, that Tim Walls is not some cuddly, joyful coach like all these mainstream media types are calling him, Hansen said. This is not who this man is. This man would like to take away your rights. He will take away your rights. What happened to me will happen to you. I've heard some people say that Walls is a really nice guy. Yeah? Well, he's not, she added. Take my word for it. 
through this whole process, I've gotten to know other people. Similar things have happened to them when they were trying to run their businesses and survive. So Tim Walls and Attorney General Keith Ellison really like to go after women. Notice who they're going after. Women, grandmas, not CEOs of major corporations, but those that run mom and pop stores. They're bullies. This is what they have done to the state of Minnesota. So let America know you do not want Tim Walls as vice president. You do not want tyranny at this level. We the people of Minnesota have seen what the Tim seen what Tim Walls, the type of evil he orchestrates if elected as vice president of this country. He is in lockstep with Kamala Harris, who is also evil will perpetuate this same type of evil on the American people. We do not want that. So this is the truth about Tim Walls. I would like to see him impeached. I would like to see him prosecuted for the crimes he has committed against the people of Minnesota, Hansen said. Tim Walls has accomplished a lot of horrific things in the state of Minnesota in a very short amount of time. That man is a wrecking machine. He needs to be stopped. End of article. Stunning. The type of totalitarianism that already exists abroad in the United States and will surely escalate should Walls and Harris assume the presidency and the vice presidency of the United States of America. Uh, Persecution and tyranny are here. God said it would come. And now it's coming right through our own front door. Let me take you to this uh, final category. And with this, we will be done. It has to do with apostasy. We know that apostasy is a sign of the last days because of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, which says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. What the Bible predicts is a gradual truth decay within the church as we get closer and closer to the end times scenario. So with that being said, notice this article. This is our last article that we're looking at from Emergent Watch. August the 12th, 2024. This to me is sad because it represents a ministry that's near and dear to my heart. It says, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa lead pastor dismisses Israel's present right to their homeland. And here's what the article says. In the latest example of the errors of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa leadership, Brian Broderson, currently co-pastoring with his son, Char Broderson, let Char take callers on live K-Wave radio. The program Calvary Chapel founder, Pastor Chuck Smith, founded a radio station when I was listening when I was living in Southern California that I listened to frequently and regularly. On on Calvary Global Network's K-Way radio program, Pastor's Perspective on August 12th, recent 2024, Calvary Chapel's soon-to-be senior pastor, Char Broderson, answered a phone call or a call in question regarding the Jewish people and their right to the biblical homeland. Here's what Broderson said, quote, I do not think any of us should be supporting any nation on earth just with our whole heart blindly. To answer your question, you know the land of Israel and its right to belong to Messiah. God will eventually restore the land to Israel under Messiah Now, I do not think that the nation of Israel, that it is now a fulfillment of that promise. Because the detail is missing, that the Messiah is there and being submitted to and recognized for his authority 
as the true and only king. And that's not happening. So I do not think the modern state of Israel is the fulfillment of these biblical prophecies and promises. Now, this is a ministry under its founder, Chuck Smith, that had a great impact on my life. Uh, I grew up in the Orange County area. I frequented his Sunday evening services at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa for years. And he was always pro-Israel. And he always taught that the regathering of the Jewish people into their ancient homeland, although they're not yet in faith, was, was a work of God. And now what you see here with Brian Broderson taking over that role, and now his son, is that they are denying that Israel in the land today is any kind of fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The article does a nice job theologically refuting what Broderson is saying by using Genesis 17 verses 7 and 8 and 1 Chronicles 16 verses 14 through 18. Let me read you the conclusion of the article. It says, so on the K-Wave radio program, Char or is saying that the Jewish people currently in the modern state of Israel are not the people spoken of in the Bible and that thus are not biblically entitled to the land. And by extension, none of the prophecies and promises in the Bible would apply to them. The implication of this view, the implications of this viewpoint are legion not to mention being opposed to Calvary Chapel founder Chuck Smith's teachings in what appears to be yet another bid to be popular and relevant to the current culture, Char has again attempted to emerge from the outdated culture of Calvary Chapel. Now, you see what is being said here in this article. All of these new teachings that Israel in the land is not prophetically significant something that the founders of the Calvary Chapel movement didn't embrace, but apparently Brian Broderson and his son, the heirs of those ministries, uh, do embrace. They're, they're promoting these ideas all under the guise of we have to reach the youth. Truth has to be jettisoned to reach the culture. I've watched since the 1980s uh, the seeker-friendly movement, Rick Warren, Robert Schuller, Joel Osteen, etc., saying this over and over again. Let's de-emphasize certain biblical truths because we've got to reach the next generation. Uh, Chuck Smith reached a lot of young people. He spearheaded, as God gave him the ability, the Jesus Revolution, where all of these hippies came to Christ, and he never watered down the truth. He always taught Israel in the land today, although it's not the final form of what God is going to do. It's an initial step, and God has brought them into their own land in unbelief in preparation for that program. Now, as Char Broderson moves away from that, he is engaged in apostasy. He is drifting away from truth previously known or truth previously acknowledged, which actually is what God said would happen in the end times. Now, I want to be really careful about this critique because every single Calvary Chapel pastor that I know, I know a lot of them, would not agree with what Broderson is doing here. But there has been a, sh a split, if you will, in the Calvary Chapel movement where Broderson is taking one wing of the movement one direction in more of a liberal direction. And there's others that are more conservative that are still holding the line. So I'm not trying to blanket or broad brush here. I'm just noting here that Broderson is moving away from previously acknowledged truth. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the founder of the movement that now signs his paycheck <laughs> uh, believed. But he is progressing, regressing, might be a better word, away from truth, which is the very definition of apostasy, which is what 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 said would happen in the end times. We need to do this to appease the masses, to scratch those itching ears, to win the young and the culture for Christ. 
I, I can't tell you the amount of apostasy I have seen in my lifetime under the banner of we need to do this to reach the youth. Apparently the same thing is happening at the flagship of the Calvary Chapel movement at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Well, Andy, why are you going on and on about this? I'm going on and on about this because I saw this happen in my own movement, the Bible church movement. When I was a student at seminary, I heard many, many professors at the school that I was attending for my master's degree and doctoral degree. I even heard the president, and I have the president in print promoting this and saying this, that Israel in the land today, because she's not in faith, is not a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. That is a drift away from what the Bible church movement used to believe. Notice this quote here from the late, great John Walvoord. He says, of the many peculiar phenomena which characterize the present generation, few events, and I believe he said this in the 1960s, few events can claim equal significance as far as biblical prophecy is concerned with that of the return of Israel to their land. It constitutes the preparation for the end of the age the setting for the coming of the Lord for his church, and the fulfillment of Israel's prophetic destiny. Notice that Walverd, just like Chuck Smith said, Israel in the land today, in unbelief, is prophetically significant. The new movement within the Bible church movement started to say, you know what, we don't really know if the Jews in the land today are prophetically significant. That's the same trajectory Char Broderson is taking his wing of the Calvary Chapel movement through. And that is a clear sign of apostasy. In fact, how do you know if you're sitting in a church that was formally dispensational, formally premillennial, formally pre-tribulational, formally Zionist. How, how can you tell if they're moving away from that position? You ask them a question about the modern state of Israel. And if they will not acknowledge the modern state of Israel as the fulfillment of Bible prophecy as prophetically significant, although it's not in its final, final form, it's preparatory, if they won't acknowledge at least that, then you're sitting in a church that, that's moving away from its historic, prophetic, historical doctrines, dogmas, and traditions. I mean, anytime you join a church or want to become a member of a church or a regular attender of a church and you sit down with the leadership of that church, you need to ask them the question, what's your view on the modern state of Israel? And if they start to hem and haw, and come up with reasons as to why they don't think the modern state of Israel is prophetically significant, then it's time to leave that church. In fact, in the Dallas area, we, our family, left a church because a missionary speaker got into the pulpit and denied that Israel, as she currently exists, is an outworking of God's purposes. This particular speaker said that Israel in the land today is Ishmael rather than Isaac. Isaac, the child of faith, Ishmael, the child of works. Israel is nothing more than a Zionist prop-up nation. It's got nothing to do with God. And when I heard that, I said to my wife, my family, we need to find another church because this church is moving away from what it has historically taught concerning Zionism, dispensationalism, premillennialism, pre-tribulationalism, etc. That is a key barometer that you can look at to, to figure out if a movement is apostatizing from its roots in prophetic truth. Ezekiel 36 verse 24 says this, For I will take you from the nations, referring to Israel, and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean and put a new spirit in you. Ezekiel says God is going to bring them back in unbelief first. We're watching that happen. 
before he brings them to faith, which will happen in the events of the Great Tribulation period. And saying Israel in the land is not prophetically significant is to deny what Ezekiel 36 verses 24 and following are speaking of. Notice Ezekiel 37. So I prophesied, verse 7, as I was commanded, and there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together. And I looked, and behold, the sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they came to life. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. You see how God puts the skeleton together first? And the skin and the muscles? But at a later point, he puts the breath into the body? Putting the breath into the body is just as much a work of God as God putting the skeleton together in the first place. So when you see the Jews in the land today, just because they're not in faith, you don't say to yourself, well, the Messiah is not ruling, it's not a work of God. It is a work of God. And any church or movement that claims it's not a work of God is apostatizing from its foundation. It doesn't matter how great its foundation was, spearheaded by none other than Chuck Smith, spearheaded by none other than John Walford. You start denying Israel in the land today is prophetically significant. You are apostatizing or moving away from truth. That's why you always ask any spiritual leader when you're trying to figure out where they're coming from, what is your position on Israel in the land. Any hemming or hawing tells you you're dealing with an apostatizing group, movement, school, institution, which should cause you to second guess whether you want to be involved with that particular movement at all. Find a church that faithfully teaches the Bible. Find a church that faithfully teaches Bible prophecy. Find a church that talks about the full gamut of God's program, which is gathering Israel in unbelief before he brings them to spiritual life. Israel is not an accident or a catastrophe. She is the miracle on the Mediterranean. There were countless things that had to go right for that nation to be born. And to say that it's not the hand of God is like being struck by lightning in your life you know, five or six times. The statistics are not in your favor. And so I bring this to your attention because it shows you the type of apostasy that we're into now in the church age, which is also a sign of the times. In terms of good news, by way of closing, we want to draw your attention to the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 13 which says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Things are not falling apart. They're falling into place. Going back to our review slide, what we've dealt with in these two sessions is the Gog-Magog alignment, the world against Israel alignment, movements towards Temple 3. In this particular episode, we talked about the trend towards globalism, the significance of the USA in decline, the coming persecution, apostasy within evangelicalism. These are all signs alerting us to the messianic time period that we're living in. And yet through it all, there's some very good news. That before the wrath of God hits planet Earth, Jesus is coming to rescue his church from the earth via the rapture of the church. And people can be dialed into that promise even as I speak, simply by believing or trusting for their salvation in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I hope many people are doing that even now. A few uh, infomercials encourage you to download the Andy Woods Ministries app where you can get all of our recent content and even older content is constantly being uploaded onto that app. Enjoy Pastor's Point of View and Podcast format. Just go to wherever it is you get your podcast. Type in Andy Woods Ministries into the search engine 
and you can enjoy Pastor's Point of View in podcast format. I would encourage you to go to the Andy Woods Ministries website where there's a conspicuous way on the home page to, sh- to sign up for our show notes. These show notes that I'm reading from will show up in your inbox every time we pass a new, post a new Pastor's Point of View show. Our content can be found at that website as well. I'm the president of a school, Chafer Theological Seminary. If you're interested in seminary training, check out chafer.edu. And uh, we're now enrolling people for our fall semester. So take a class, see how you feel. A lot of quality classes being offered for this coming fall semester. Our academic journal is available. There's um, a slide there where you can access that via the QR code. I mentioned on the last show, which I'll re-mention again, the... SLBC Prophecy Conference that's coming up February 21st through 23rd of next year, 2025. A great conference dealing with faith for final days, worldview, and prophecy issues. The best of the best presenting there, including Bill Federer, Olivier Milnick, Dr. Randall Price, all-day conference on Saturday, banquet Friday evening at nearby Sugar Creek Country Club and invite you to stick around for our main services that Sunday, February 23rd, as our conference speakers will be presenting at those services. We have music from Olam Worship. Also, Claude and Rebecca Chu will be leading worship during the banquet. And go to to the slbc.org homepage to register. Registration actually is is already filling up, so you want to make sure that you are registered. It's a great time just to get together, come out of your normal ritual and routine, be fortified, edified with sound, biblical, prophetic, and worldview teaching to equip you wherever God has you. Also, I want to start announcing fall conference schedule conferences that I'm going to be participating in this fall. The one I just announced is the spring 2025. Well, what about fall 2024? I want to make you aware of a biblical citizenship conference, September 20th through 22nd at Tacoma Grace Bible Church in the state of Washington. What a timely topic as myself, Jeremy Thomas, Paul Miles, Dane Rogers are gonna be talking about biblical citizenship in light of the upcoming election. As you can see on the screen, there's a QR code where you can find out all about this conference For these fall conferences, we would encourage you not to call our church because we don't really have the information, but but to call these churches that are sponsoring this conference if you have questions. In this case, Tacoma Grace Bible Church. There on the previous slide, there's a phone number, website, etc., where you can contact that church. Also, Duluth Bible Church... October 2nd through the 6th, 2024, is featuring its fall Bible Church Family Conference. Uh, The first part of it consists of presentations by pastors to full-time Christian workers. And that part of the conference goes Wednesday, October the 2nd through Thursday, October the 3rd. There's all the different sessions that people can take advantage of at this particular section of the conference. I'm one of the speakers. Um, I'm going to have the opportunity to teach on the parable of the talents. Very misunderstood. People want to apply that to the church, but it really relates to Israel. And this whole conference is going to cover Matthew 24 and 25, which will rightly divide the Olivet Discourse and teach it as it's designed to be taught as something related to Israel with application to the church, but not direct meaning to the church. And you see all the 
different presenters that are going to be involved in that. And then we'll follow the All Believers Conference Thursday evening, the 3rd, all the way through Saturday, October the 6th. I'm presenting Thursday evening, October the 3rd, on the prologue of John's Gospel. So consider taking advantage of the Duluth Bible Church Fall Conference also coming up, November 1st through 3rd is the Worldview Weekend Conference hosted by Brandon House, and um, it's going to be held at Lake of the Ozarks, a t- tremendous hotel that we've used there many times. It's a Worldview Conference. Speakers include Rob Manis, Dr. Rob Linstead, Leo Homan, Sharam Hadian. Aaron Lavarco, Patrick Wood, Brandon House, myself, Dr. James Thorpe, and Bill Frederer. Great Worldview Conference. Encourage you to uh, look into that. Um, That screenshot that we have there should give you the phone number and the places you can go online to learn more about that conference. And finally, last but not least, is the Pre-Trib Study Group Conference coming up December 9th through 11th, 2024. Great lineup this year. I'm actually one of the presenters dealing with the apostasy controversy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, trying to make the case that that's actually speaking of the rapture of the church, which is not a majority view. It is a minority view. It has legs to it, as I'll try to show, show you. But check out that particular conference if you're interested in some hardcore teaching on prophecy, eschatology, coming from top academic thinkers. I apologize, folks, for going just a tad long in this session, (laughs) but I wanted to get all this in. Thank you for watching, praying for, sharing Pastor's point of view. Pray for Pastor Jim. Um, The reason he's not with us in these last few shows is he's had some health issues You can kind of get an update on his health issues by going to his personal Facebook page, uh, Jim McGowan. You can find out what's going on with him uh, because he posts regularly what's going on with his health. But he needs needs prayer. We all need prayer uh, to stand for the Lord in these difficult last days. And uh, we'll see you next time, Lord willing, on Pastor's Point of View. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. God bless you.